Hey everyone, my name is Vikram Shah, MCAT expert in 528 score. Today we have a really cool video coming your way. Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to walk through a bio biochem passage as if I were taking it during an actual MCAT and kind of give some of my thoughts out loud as I approach this. Um, so hopefully you're able to kind of get some strategies, kind of get some insight into how we can kind of sift uh, between important and unimportant information. Um, I do want to point out that there's no one right way to take an MCAT passage. Um, really choose whatever strategy works best for you, works best with the way you think. Um, because again, there's there's no one right way to do this. Um, so hopefully by me doing it, you can kind of maybe get some insights that you can incorporate into your own um, method of approaching the passages and your own way of thinking. Um, so with that, um, we'll get started. So this is a bio biochem passage. On your test, it would probably rank between about an easy and an, in a medium passage. So somewhere around there. Um, so yeah, I really hope you enjoy it and uh, let's get started. All right, let's get started on this passage. And so, like I mentioned earlier, this is gonna be a bio-biochem passage. Um, again, kind of more e uh, easy to medium level that you would get on your actual test. Um, and so what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna go through it. I'm gonna talk out loud, so it's, I'm not gonna take it in the exact um, eight minutes that you should take a bio-biochem passage or really any science passage for that matter in. Um, so we're not gonna get it done in, in exactly eight minutes. So I'm gonna kind of take a little bit of time as I'm going through it. Um, and highlight some of the big points, highlight, you know, when a word shows up in the passage, it should kind of you know, get a ring a bell in your head so that, um, because, it, because it's a high yield uh, topic and it's something that they're likely to return back to in the questions. Um, and we're also gonna kind of cover how we're gonna analyze figures quickly using the TAPE-P approach. Um, and for those of you that aren't familiar, TAPE-P is gonna be, T is the title, A are the axes, which kind of feed into the I, which is independent variable, D, dependent variable, and P patterns. And I really think that last one's the most important. Figuring out, you know, what are the big patterns in the figure? And those are usually going to be what the MCAT's going to test you on. So um, yeah, I'm super excited. Um, let's hop on in. All right. So pro, that's a, that's a pretty long word. Um, let's just call them P, the, the, you know, what it's in the parentheses. POMC neurons in the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus, ARH, control energy homeostasis by sensing hormonal and nutrient cues, and activating secondary melanocortin sensing neurons. Researchers identified the expression of a G-protein coupled receptor, GPR17, so that seems important. And also important, I think, that we're looking at a G-protein coupled receptor. So that's a pretty high yield topic. Um, so they might come back to that. Um, in the ARH and hypothesize that it contributes to the regulatory function of POMC neurons on metabolism. Since the, the, the AMC writes passages by taking a scientific article and just adapting them. Like this literally basically looks like a scientific article. Anytime you hear hypothesis, I usually think that's, it's usually pretty important. And so what we're gonna do is we can write hypothesis and let's just kind of draw out the logic of their hypothesis. So they're basically saying that these GPR 17 and POMC are gonna to contribute to metabolism. Okay, cool. Excuse my handwriting. Um, all right, so in order to test this hypothesis, researchers generated POMC neuron-specific GPR17 knockouts, so PGKO mice, determined their energy and glucose metabolic phenotypes. Um, so that looks like it's going to be our dependent variable. So I always think anytime, you know, they're throwing an experiment at you, per, it's a really good time to highlight those out. Um, on normal chow diet and a high-fat diet, boom, those are our independent variables. Right, so we're changing their diet, measuring their uh, energy and glucose metabolic phenotypes. In experiment one, we're now getting into the good stuff. Researchers measured body weight and weight gain of wild type and PGKO mice fed on a high fat diet. Body weight was assessed at five months and 10 months after the diet change for adult mice. Results are shown in figure one. All right, so let's apply our TAID-P method. So title, change in body weight and weight gain. So that's gonna be our dependent variables, I believe for wild type versus PGKO. PGKO, remember, was our GPR17 knockout. And again, we're hypothesizing that GPR17 plays a role in metabolism in all of the mice on a high fat diet. So we're not even looking at this normal chow diet. So let's look at this first part. So our axes, we have the time. So we're changing it between five and 10 months. And we also have um, on this other side, we're, we're changing you know, for wild type versus our GPR17 knockout. 
on the y-axis, we have our body weight and we have weight gain on the other one. And so anytime y-axis is going to be your dependent variable and, and, and x-axis is always going to be your independent variable. And so now let's get to the really important part. What are our patterns? And so here, for and, and I think on, on the left panel, it's interesting that wild type, you see a pretty big increase in body weight over that five month period, whereas for the PGKO, you're not increasing that much. Um, and so I think what they're literally doing is just taking that increase and plotting it on the right. And so you see a big weight gain for the wild type and a smaller weight gain for PGKO. Um, and it is significant. And I think that's important to remember because they might come back to that. Um, all right, so let's, let's continue on. So I think we, we analyzed figure one pretty good. Neuropeptides from POMC neurons are known to play a role in appetite regulation. Alpha MSH is anorexigenic, while the effect of beta endorphin on satiety, satiety is content dependent. The bioavailability of alpha MSH and beta endorphin uh, is partially determined by the expression of POMC and subsequent proteolytic processing by PC1, PC2, and CPD. Researchers measured alpha MSH and beta endorphin, beta endorphin and POMC neuropeptides in the medial basal hypothalamic samples from mice fed high fat diet for two weeks. Results are shown in figure two. Um, it's kind of a mouthful. Um, essentially they're looking at these neuropeptides. And so I think, you know, alpha MSH and B beta endorphin are, are um, examples of these neuropeptides that, they're, that are gonna be important. Um, so here again, researchers are measuring these neuropeptides. So those are gonna be our dependent variable in a mice fed this high fat diet. So let's take a look at figure, at figure two now. Um, so here it says changes in levels of POMC neuropeptides. Anytime you're, you know, you're changing that level, it's probably gonna be your dependent variable. Um, and so what do we see in, in this uh, panel B? Um, so um, axes, right? And axes and independent variable, let's look at the x-axis. We see male versus female. So those are gonna be, that's gonna be one uh, kind of independent variable. And the other one, which I think is important to point out, and a lot of times experiments will do this is they'll have kind of two layers of independent variables, is you also have wild type versus PGKO. So you have male versus female, and then whether or not you have this GPR-17 knockout. Um, and then the y-axis, which is always gonna be, you know, your dependent variable, is the levels of these neuropeptides that we talked about earlier, alpha MSH or beta endorphin. Um, and then let's look at our patterns. So really for the males, it's not super interesting. You know, they, it looks like they just have lower levels of the neuropeptides. And when they, and, and when they have the PGKO knockout, nothing really happens, right? So that's kind of, I mean, that's what I'm, I'm going to take away from, from the males here. Um, females here are a bit more interesting. So I think one thing we can note is that they have increased level of the neuropeptides compared to males. So compared to males. And then also the next interesting thing is that we see significance for the wild type versus PGKO condition for females. So for some reason in the PGKO knockout, PGKO um, condition, which is, I guess is already in the knockout, you have increased neuropeptides. Um, so I think that's a pretty interesting finding. Um, so, all right. So now we've, uh, we've, you know, gone through our passage. So let's go ahead and move on to the, the questions. Um, all right, so researchers hypothesize that PGKO mice maintain a low weight on a high fat diet by increasing beta oxidation. If that hypothesis is correct, what molecule might they find at a higher level? So this question is very similar to a lot of MCAT questions in that it's introducing kind of a new study. And so here they're saying that they're maintaining a low weight, right, which is what we saw earlier in figure one, these PGKO mice don't have this big weight gain by increasing beta oxidation. So this is ex external information. We didn't know this before. The new study is telling us this, or a new hypothesis. So now we're supposed to suppose if that's correct, if it is indeed beta oxidation that's really doing, um, helping them maintain this low fat diet, what molecule are they gonna find at a higher, at a higher level in these wild type, uh, than wild type mice? And so we, we know from, from biochemistry that beta oxidation produces acetyl-CoA. And so right off the bat, we can think, hey, answer choice B is looking pretty good. We also know that you can't take fat, in humans, you can, I think, in other organisms, but in humans, you can't take fats and net convert them back to, and, and I guess ma mammals, since we're looking at mice, not humans, um, but you can't net convert fatty acids into carbohydrates. And so 
For that reason, we couldn't undergo gluconeogenesis. So we're not going to have pyruvate, glucose 6-phosphate, or glucose 1-phosphate. And so for that reason, our answer choice is going to be, correct answer here is going to be B. All right, based on figure two, which of the following conclusions is true? Females have higher levels of POMC neurons. So they're measuring neuropeptides, not neurons. So yes, maybe, maybe they just have more neurons, which is why they have more neuropeptides. But you see how we made, we made a leap there. And I, you, you can't make that, you can't do that on the MCAT especially on cars. That's the, they'll really get you a lot on cars doing that. Um, PGKO mice produce higher levels of neuropeptides. Um, yes, in the female condition, but not in the male condition. And so if any part of your answer is wrong, we can't, we can't say B, right? A counter example is males, right? We saw earlier in the male condition, the PGKO knockout is not producing higher levels of neuropeptides. All right, let's go on to the next one. Wild-type females have higher levels of alpha MSH than wild-type males. Um, so let's look at that. Um, so one thing we said earlier when we analyzed the figures that females have increased neuropeptides compared to males. And we know alpha MSH is measured in this left graph. Um, so let's look and let's see. We're comparing these two. Let me change up my colors here so you can see it. But we're comparing this bar with this bar, right? Those are our wild-type conditions. And we're measuring alpha MSH. And since we have those three dots right there, these are significant. So that's probably going to be our right answer. Um, and then last one, wild-type males have higher levels of intracellular beta endorphin than wild-type females. Um, and so like we said earlier, the wild-type males um, don't, uh, are usually have lower, or yeah, lower neuropeptides compared to, to females. And so let's, let's for, for thoroughness's sake, let's look over at our beta endorphin graph. You can see here, between these two conditions, they're just about the same. Um, and so we can kind of conclude that they don't have higher levels. So answer choice C is gonna be our correct answer here. All right, let's go to, let's go to question three. So researchers are interested in, interested in studying a new GPCR, G-protein coupled receptor called GPCR84. Which of the following mutations may researchers introduce to the protein to decrease GPCR signaling? Okay, again, here, MCAT, had you read this long passage and is now bringing in extra information and really just asking you a question about what do, what's maybe a property of GPCRs. Um, and so what do we know about GPCRs? And I think the really important thing is remember there's, we have that alpha subunit and when it's bound to GTP, it can do a bunch of things, right? That's kind of the active form and that's what activates the signaling pathway. In addition to kind of dissociating that, that beta gamma, those beta gamma subunits can also do things. Though really the alpha, alpha subunit is super important here. And so if we want to decrease that, what are things we can do? Um, one big one, especially for GTP systems, is, you know, just put a, put a GDP on there. And so now let's look with kind of, with that thought process on, in mind, let's look at the answer choices. First one says mutate the alpha subunit of GPCR84 so it's locked in a GDP bound form. So that's, I mean, that kind of aligns with what we were thinking. Um, mutate the alpha subunit so it's locked in a GTP bound form. So that would do the opposite. That would kind of increase activity. Add an agonist ligand that binds to GPCR84. So agonists um, usually kind of activate things, whereas antagonists are going to inactivate. If we add an agonist, it's probably going to increase the activity of GPCR84. And then express GPCR84 on cellular surfaces that are spatially close to agonist ligands. Again, we have agonists are close to GPCR probably going to activate them instead of, uh, instead of decreased signal. And so here we can kind of narrow all the way down to answer choice A. Let's go into our next question. Researchers observe a surge in alpha MSH immediately after eating along, eating along with which other hormone? Um, okay, so it talked about alpha MSH. Um, here it kind of seems, and especially just glimpsing at the answer choices, none of these other um, uh, none of these other hormones are really mentioned in the passage. So I think we're kind of safe to, to think that this question is really relying on our outside knowledge. And so what do we know happens after we eat? Well, we have a bunch of glucose in our bloodstream and we want to kind of take that up into the cells. And we know that the hormone that does this, that decreases our amount of, the amount of glucose in our bloodstream, takes it in so that we can um, undergo glycolysis, um, glycogenesis, all these things. We know that that's going to be insulin. Cool. All right, so this you can kind of see, we had the whole, again, whole long passage there, but they're kind of asking a question outside, right? They're requiring you to draw in some outside knowledge. 
And really, alpha MSH here is completely unnecessary to the question. You could say researchers observe a surge in which of the following hormones after eating, right? You didn't even have to throw an alpha MSH in this, uh, in this question, right? So you can kind of think of it as a distractor here. All right, let's go to the last question. In, in the high-fat diet, researchers feed mice unsaturated fats. Which of the following represents a fat with the most double bonds? And so while I'm not, I don't really remember all of my fatty acid nomenclature, but I think we can figure this one out. And so um, I believe the first number is the number of carbons. Uh, and, and, and I know the second number, it, this, this number here with the delta behind it, indicates the number of, of, uh, of double bonds, right? And so um, one way we can also um, kind of figure that out is that it's mentioning the positions. So, you know, in answer choice A, there's one at position nine. In answer choice B, there's two at positions nine and 12. Answer choice C, there's one at position 17. Answer choice D has three of them. And so this is going to be our correct answer choice. Um, and so let me pull up the correct answers really quickly. Um, perfect. All right. So looks like we're all set. B, C, A, A, D. And so hopefully um, by going through this passage, you can take away a couple things. One, how it's super important to identify, um, let me highlight the things that we kind of looked at. One, it's super important to identify independent, dependent variables, hypotheses. A lot of times there are gonna be more questions about these parts of your, pa of, of your passage. It's important to draw these dependent, independent variables down back to your graphs, right? And we, I think we did a really good job today analyzing the graphs and seeing exactly what was going on. Um, and thankfully, these were simpler graphs, but the same principles apply for more difficult graphs. And we're gonna go through um, some passages later on with more, with more difficult graphs. And again, here at the very bottom, this was a more challenging graph than the first one, and we were able to get through it and take away the really take home points. Um, in addition, as we were going through the answer choices, instead of immediately always looking at the answer choices, we tried to kind of form a mold or an idea of what we thought the answer choice was before then going through and using process of elimination. Um, and in addition, in addition, you can really see how the, the, the MCAT is not necessarily a test of strict content, but it's gonna require you to take content from outside and apply it to the passage. See what's useful from your outside, see what's useful from the passage, and really combine these, combine these things to, um, to answer the questions correctly. Um, so yeah, I really hope um, you found this video useful. Again, no one method works for every person. And so I wanna encourage you to try, to try out everything on your own, um, try out a bunch of different strategies, see what sticks for you and for your method of thinking. Um, and the last thing I'll leave you with is, um, and again, I've mentioned this before, is um, uh, one of the, a, a very famous football coach named Vince Lombardi said, practice doesn't make perfect, perfect practice makes perfect. And so after taking a passage like this, I would really encourage you to come back if you didn't understand the figures as you were taking the passage, sit down, apply the TAPE-P method and really go through them in great detail. Um, and then if you're missing any of the questions, go through the questions, write down what you missed, and then come back and study it so that you don't miss it again, right? You want to approach every new exam with a new body of information. Thank you for watching this video. And if you liked it, I hope you give it a thumbs up or subscribe. And if you'd like to get in every last bit of practice before test day, click the link in our description to sign up for a free MCAT question of the day. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.